right. Good morning, yogis, meditators, humans. We're going to continue our journey in the Yoga Sutras. And today we're on Sutra 129, which references the last two sutras. So for sake of um, just context here, Sutra 27 um, spoke about the sound of Om, the mystic sound of Om. And then 28 said to repeat it with reflection on its meaning helps, is an aid. So if as your practice, om, om, om. <laughs> um, and then when we get to 129, the direct translation says this, from this practice, all the obstacles disappear and simultaneously dawns knowledge of the inner capital S self. From this practice, all the obstacles disappear and simultaneously dawns knowledge of the inner self. Well, that sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> you just ohm and um, all the obstacles will disappear. And you'll understand the inner self. Um, what he says in the commentary is, um, I'll read it because I think it's, um, it provides just motivation. He says, you get in tune with the cosmic power. By that tuning, you feel that force in you, imbibe all those qualities, get the cosmic vision, transcend all your limitations, and finally become that transcendental reality. Normally, the mind and body limit you, but by holding something infinite, you slowly raise yourself from the finite objects that bind you and you transcend them. Sounds um, pretty great. And mindfulness of a sound or a mantra is the path. Now there's a lot more left in this book. <laughs> so what he's pretty much saying is the path is simple, um, but it's not necessarily easy. And the way we start is by learning to focus the mind through these practices. So um, the, really the first stage of our practice is to learn to concentrate and a syllable or a mantra is the tool that he recommends. Um, our mind, however, is designed to think and do more than just repeat. Um, and so how does it work? What he's saying is that if we can learn to focus our mind through japa meditation, repetition, or other methods, then we'll start to understand the nature of reality. Um, and in my experience, the mind goes away from that concentration on the object into other states. And those are the places where he's talking about this higher connection but the path to get there is through concentration all right so when we're wandering around in the world distracted by everything it's unlikely that we're gonna see the nature of reality because we're getting so much input so the practices narrow our attention in a way that allows us to have more awareness of the nature of reality not distracted by all of the things that are constantly trying to fool us, you know, the objects of desire and aversion. Unfortunately, it takes lots of practice, right? So we, we practice. Um, this morning when I logged in um, to this computer, I smiled and laughed at myself because um, I have a deep samskara in my fingers of typing the password that I use for my own computer. All right, so I sit down and I log in. I do this pretty much every day in this room and I always type in my other password because it's just like automatic. 
Um, and, but that's what we're trying to create through these meditation practices. We're trying to create an automatic place of stability so that we can come out of distraction and into attention. Um, which is why practicing something consistently is important. All right, so if you change your mantra every time you sit down, it's not going to be there for you. And what he said in the last sutra was, um, keep your mantra secret. You know, we can take that or leave it, but I can't tell you what your mantra should be. I don't know your inner spiritual leaning, longing. Um, I can suggest you use the breath, but if you have a mantra that has meaning for you, um, spiritual or secular, whatever it is, um, my invitation is to stick with it. Even if it's breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. Any questions or comments before I throw you into a mantra meditation that's a little bit on your own? Um, I won't be telling you what to say or do. I'll be inviting you to anchor your attention on your mantra. Okay. And if you're new to this and you're still trying to find your way, just pick something for today. And if it's not your thing, you know, you've got time. Okay. So with that, I'll invite each of us to take a seat on purpose. Take your last sip of coffee. Move your cat. <laughs> And then when you're um, situated, close your eyes or lower them so that your attention comes more inward. And then once your outer distractions are minimized, notice your physical posture from the inside out. Create your, your seat as a supportive foundation. Maybe your feet, if I'm sitting on a chair, so my feet are touching the floor on purpose, they're grounded. And do something on purpose with your hands. Create your posture upright, alert, and relaxed. Notice your breath without altering it very much. So the noticing usually alters it at least a little bit, but aim to just rest your attention on your breath. I find it helpful to pair my mantra with the breath. So there's a connection between my attention and the rhythm of my breath. your attention lightly on the breath.
during our practice today, I'll draw you back with my voice a few times. I invite you to do the same as you notice your mind wandering away. And maybe a half smile and come back to your breath and your mantra. does wander away and notice where your attention is going just acknowledge what's drawing you in and maybe a little half smile and begin again
starts to wander away. Like you're training a puppy, just with a gentleness. Sit, stay. some bigger breaths. A 
least one more nice big breath. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. So, um, um, my dad, hi dad, <laughs> um, asked me once kind of a little bit about my practice and how I know what to do. Um, what I read, what I study. Most days my practice is something like what we did today, which is just really simple, nothing fancy, stabilizing practice. Um, usually on Saturdays, um, I do some kind of deeper study and reading and just working with a little bit more um, just a feeling tone or an inquiry in my practice um, and I'm not saying that's the right path to do this um, but my experience has been that some stabilizing practice is a good foundation and then when we need to really look into something that we're dealing with or do some deeper work um, we have the stabilizing practice to come back to if it gets a little bit unsteady. All right, so um, one of my favorite quotes is that, I think it's from Thich Nhat Hanh, and that meditation isn't a serene encounter with reality. It's like, sometimes it's facing our hard stuff, right? It's not just all rainbows and unicorns. But we do need to be able to especially since it's usually a solitary practice, to be able to like bring ourselves back to a place where um, we're okay. So the stabilizing practice is a good foundational practice. Um, not necessarily using it all the time and avoiding dealing with whatever your meditation can help you with, but to use it as a place to come back to if you need to. Any questions or insights or Anything else you want to share? It's hard to meditate with these cats around sometimes. You know, and it not to be funny, especially this two-eyed cat. She's all she's all around. So I'm trying to. I can't even find a spot to do it by myself because they're always around. You know, and if I shut a door, she's scratching at it. So I'm learning to literally block everything out and just kind of keep going which is a little tough but useful yeah yeah right right because the real world's like that right <laughs> that's just not the llama. i mean the other thing that i'll offer is if you really need a moment go get in your car <laughs> i mean sometimes i do that if i can't like get it at home i'll just go to work early and sit in my car <laughs> But it's, I mean, you're right, it's practice. Like the world is full of noise and if we can learn to find peace in the middle of it, that's good practice. <laughs>